Good morning, everybody, and once again, welcome back to our last day here at the Nordic Pavilion uh, COP27. Welcome also to the audience that follow us online. Every morning, uh, we have uh, taken a close look at the future. How we will build, eat, cook, invest, and live if we were to meet the 1.5 degree target. What changes need to be made, and how will they impact our everyday lives? We know that the future starts with the decision we make today. We came to COP27 with a sense of urgency. We know that the science tells us that we are already running out of time. Technological fix is not enough. We need systemic change within every sector. We have heard this before, so why is COP27 seemingly not responding in an adequate manner? The pandemic showed us that we can respond rapidly to crisis. So how can we use this ability to change the climate as well? On the first day of a COP, we uh, heard Professor Johan Rockström tell, tell us that we are not even close doing enough to get the climate in balance. This might be the last COP where we had the chance to turn the climate crisis around and keeping the 1.5 degree target alive. Keeping this in mind and uh, closing in on the last day of negotiations, what kind of decision can we hope for? To discuss and maybe answer some of these uh, challenges, uh, we have uh, a really competent panel here on the stage. Espen Bart Eide, a Norwegian Minister for Climate and the Environment. Hans uh, Brönnik, uh, who is um, Executive Director at the European Environment uh, Agency. Marco Olikainen, uh, Professor Eminitus and Research, Research Director, Department of Economics and Management at the University of Helsinki. And might I add also kind of uh, the founding father of the Finnish Climate Panel in 2020 to 23. Uh, we are waiting for uh, Matilde Angertwet as well, the Norwegian Youth Delegate to the UNFCCC. She will be here shortly. So let me start. Um, this COP is all about implementation from, uh, and from what we have heard from the chief negotiators during the two weeks of negotiation, it's not going all that well. We get the sense of uh, that the parties has dug down in trenches um, and um, finance seems to be the overall problem. Espen Bart Eide, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, you are as close to the negotiations as is, is, is it possible to be. So what are your thoughts on how the negotiations is going at the moment? So begin with the good news i think the the mood is uh, reasonably positive and there is hard work going on a lot of goodwill uh, so there is absolutely hope that this can land uh, some of the most important outstanding issues in a good way there's no reason to say otherwise but you're also right that it's late in the day and there are still uh, unusually many outstanding issues at this thursday morning so the credibility of this ending on Friday afternoon is, uh, you know, is less likely than uh, keeping uh, global warming under 1.5 degrees, to put it that way. <laughs> but but um, uh, but we're working on it, and and the the whole conference has uh, moved into a new gear. Uh, we have now uh, lifted many of the major issues to ministerial level, and we have now five pairs of ministers who are facilitating the outstanding issues. I belong to one of them which is, to be frank, not the most important one now because the main issue on Article 6 was solved last year. Last year, But the key ones, of course, are mitigation, finance, loss and damage, uh, and, um, yeah, well, adaptation. Uh, uh, so so uh, this is ongoing work, and a lot will happen today. We just got the cover decision draft. It's a kind of less than a zero draft because it's very broad. It's way too broad. We're looking at it right now and hope that uh, in the course of the day we'll have a real zero draft which is uh, sharper and more concentrated and more focused. And I think that success in this COP requires at least two things. 
Uh, first, it requires a very strong reconfirmation of 1.5 of everything Glasgow and a strengthened language on implementation of mitigation. Because without mitigation, everything else is in vain. Because adaptation and loss and damage, which are incredibly important issues that we work hard on, are getting exponentially more expensive for every decimal above 1.5. So you simply, if you're interested in loss and damage, you should really be interested in mitigation because if you lose mitigation, it will be uh, astronomical cost uh, of loss and damage. So the other issue is financing, as you said. And uh, again, a piece of good news is that all countries agree that there should be something on loss and damage, but we're discussing whether it's a dedicated facility or whether we should rather broaden the scope and look at the all relevant aspects of the UN systems, those that work on disaster relief, um, reconstruction and development, uh, migration, and try to fit them more for the purpose of uh, loss and damage. This is still outstanding, but um, I have hope. Matilde, uh, welcome. <laughs> we, you got me a little bit nervous <laughs> at the start here. But anyway, uh, uh, from what I hear from, from uh, Espen Bartaide, he, he seems positive and hopeful uh, do you share that positivism? Mm, yeah, first of all, sorry that I was late. There was some, some uh, mixed up and confusion. Um, but I, uh, yes, but I would also like to nuance it a bit. Um, I think when you're in the meeting rooms, it's very easy to like, um, to ha become lost in what, like in, in what, the small details, right? The small language, the, the, should we use this word or this word? But I think for, we have to raise our, our um, um, vision, or how you say, a little bit. And I think for the people uh, outside of this COP, for the people back at home in Norway and, and in Europe and, and uh, everywhere else, people are not noticing these small changes, but they're noticing the big signal that we send from this COP. Um, and I think uh, the big signals we've sent from this COP has not been disastrous. It's not been very bad. It's been better than expected, I think, for many people, because we live in a difficult world right now with a lot of catastrophes, a lot of um, polarization. Um, and I think um, I would, or I, many people in, in, my, in, in my environment back at home were wor worried that that would be uh, a bigger um, polarize, have a bigger polarizing effect here at COP. So it's not been, we've kind of managed to work a little bit around those, the war in Ukraine and the, the um, other like uh, difficult um, polarization issues but at the same time we haven't I, I, I don't feel like we've sent a big um, very positive signal either it's, this is not this has not been a cop where we've said we're really together in this and we're gonna radically change our ways of, of governance or radically uh, change um, the course that we're on um, and you know that so it depends on what you expect right uh, and I think for the people who are in in these processes we don't expect that because you have to have the slow and steady change and you have to have uh, work with the processes. But I think for, m for many people outside and for, m for many young people, they expect a bigger crisis management, right? They expect us to be more worried and show our worry clearer and they expect us to act um, in, more, in more decisive uh, ways, I think. Hans uh, Brönig, um, what, what are your thoughts on, on the negotiations uh, so far? Are, are you hopeful as well? Well, let me take a little bit of a more historic perspective. Mm -hmm. We're now discussing climate change for 30 years. We started negotiating in 1990, 92 UNFCCC was ready. Uh, we are emitting continuously more every year. The curve keeps going up and there's hardly a bend in the curve. And science and knowledge is very clear. If we don't peak very soon, we are not going to stay below one and a half degrees. And so really frank talk and high ambition on peaking is necessary. And that means going into the essence of our systems of production and consumption. And yes, we are discussing uh, financing, but we're f discussing financing in terms of billions in a global economy that is closer to $100 trillion. And so I think the focus should also shift towards these fundamental, radical, systemic transitions 
that we will need in the next couple of years if we are really serious about bending the trend, about peaking and about going to a planet that will stay livable in an equitable way. And I think every step in COPs in the last years that can push us in that direction, like the one and a half degree, like uh, not only working on the energy system, but also increasingly on the food system and on, on, an, um, on the materials issue, which is neglected. Our resource use is deeply unsustainable and we need to shift that to more circularity to contribute. So those fundamental shifts and this higher sense of urgency and ambition are absolutely necessary. And that, that is a 30-year perspective that comes back every year, time and time again, and where we don't see enough fundamental systemic progress. Uh, then I also have to ask, because we, we have seen governments in Europe and in the Nordics as well uh, introducing subsidies on fossil fuels as a response to the energy crisis. This is clearly going the wrong way. Uh, and uh, how, how can we turn this around? I mean, we, we're still picking. I, I think actually, Espen, if I, uh, if I remember right, you, you have been quoted saying that the emissions will peak in 2025. Isn't I haven't said they, I said they should peak. Yeah, I yeah. would very be happy if I could say they will peak, but for the moment I think I'll uh, focus on should peak. Mm. And what Hans is saying is absolutely right. We need a systemic transition from linear to circular, from uh, fossil to renewable, and basically to make a sustainable economy in all aspects. And that's, uh, you know, that's much more than energy. That's true, that's fertilizer, that's le agriculture, that's... Uh, uh, construction, you know, it's the it's transport systems, it's it's everything, and that's what I call deep car deep decarbonization. But that's what I that's actually what the content of the mitigation work program. Mm -hmm. So we so we here in the UN lingo that means we need a very solid program committed to 1.5, uh, which is run till 2030. Will actually make sure that we do something like what the EU is doing now on its Fit for 55, which is really the world leading model of changing everything. There, there's nothing like it. It's an incredibly important uh, message. And Timmermans was just here saying that while the goal is 55%, they believe they now have adopted policies or are about to adopt policies that will take them beyond 55%. And that's because of systemic transition. The, and and I, I, I'm sorry if I sound too optimistic here, but. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we had uh, de facto climate uh, skeptics, if not to say deniers, in key Western countries. They're all gone. You know, America's back, Canada's back, Australia is back, Brazil is back in the, this club. The world, there's a lot of key leaders now that are s seriously dedicated to this large quest. And if the rich countries transform themselves, it doesn't solve the atmospheric problem, but it means that you have leadership in moving from the 20th century technology to 21st century technology much faster. And then we have to make sure that that is made available, accessible, also to developing countries and particularly to the emerging economies. That they don't go the fossil road, but that they move straight to the economy of the 21st century, which is renewable and circular. Uh, speaking of systemic change, um, how can the Nordic countries enhance these sector initiatives that are lacking behind? Mark Olikainen, um, I know that Finland has set ambitious goals. Uh, what are those and, and how will you get there? Well, we will get there very easily. But the goals are quite, uh, quite remarkable. Finland is promised to be carbon neutral by 2035. We have a new climate act that defines uh, uh, f targets for the reduction of for fossil fuel uh, emissions for 2030, 2040, and 2050. By 2050, we uh, allow only 5% of uh, uh, fossil emissions from 1990 level, and we should have uh, land use uh, sink uh, so high that by 2035 we are uh, carbon neutral. Currently, we are, our emissions are much below the required path. Given how quickly our uh, uh, energy industry has shifted to uh, uh, renewable resources and how our technology industry 
has reduced its emissions. So currently everything looks quite bright. The only problem that we have is to keep the sinks uh, as big as they need it. But this is, uh, is coming through not so much because of, let's say, government policy, but more because of we have, um, we have involved the industries in the process. So we have roadmaps that the industries have made, and they have been negotiated with the government so that the industry says that this and this we need from you if we are going to do this and this. And what industry needs from us is a safe or clear working environment and, and, and the, the good uh, horizon and things like that. So currently, I'm very hopeful for our, our case. We have heard uh, again and again uh, here on the COP27 from private uh, sector and private investors that uh, they would like to invest more in the green transition, but they are um, they need uh, regulation and they need incentives to to go about these investments. Uh, uh, I will get to you as well, uh, as uh, Marco. How do you go about that in in Finland? Yeah. That that exactly is the thing. First of all, industry wanted to have a good time horizon. Mm. And a good time horizon is to 2050 and then 2035, which gives the, uh, the, the is expected path for fossil emissions. The second thing was that there must be the things that the society must do, like providing infrastructure for required electricity and like uh, having the basis for for the shift towards uh, hydrogen economy. So once a society provides uh, a horizon and decisions for the, this change, which then opens up lots of uh, uh, commercial possibilities for industries, that I think was 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 the the key uh, a key for everything. Uh, how, how as a politician. Uh, what can you do to, to give those incentives uh, to the private investors? So th this is one of the most important questions uh, for us to answer. And the answer is well known, actually. Uh, industry, for instance, in the Nordic countries, in Europe, in many leading economies, are really dedicated to be part of this transition. And they, I think they partly want to be good citizens, but they actually also see the economic opportunity in being early movers. So they expect that. And it's not necessarily about money from the government. Sometimes it is. But in many more cases, it's about permits, regulation, uh, tax change in the tax system, fee system, uh, uh, to declare that certain things will be prohibited in the future clear climate targets to basically create the enabling environment, energy access, clean energy access, that you actually have the production and the, and the transport, the grids of clean energy. And if we, if we do the government thing right, there's a lot of people with money and technology is ready to move into this uh, next phase. And right now we're seeing in Europe, particularly, a race to the top. Uh, in Sweden, for instance, now is taking a leading role in the world in producing uh, clean steel, zero emission steel. Uh, uh, Norway is trying to do the same on al al aluminium. There are a lot of different projects around the Nordic countries. And then uh, Volvo is now starting to build cars with clean steel, uh, built in Sweden. So, so you create a market uh, in which it makes sense to do the right thing because the next layer, the car maker, also need to report on the emissions in their chain, so they would prefer to have steel or aluminium or whatever you know factor they have at the lowest possible. And that means the race to the top, because when every electric Audi is made with aluminium from Norway, that only lasts until somebody makes it even cleaner. And then they will not buy it from Norway, but maybe from Sweden or Finland, wherever else. And, and so the competition is now on for being in top of this. Uh, business know. But the governments need to be part of that through a solid partnership between government and business to identify both ambitions and what kind of rules and regulations to change. And also, if there are some old rules that we simply have to scrap because they don't fit the new world. And the, and the, the, the wave of countries in uh, Europe that is now withdrawing from this very fossil agreement of uh, 
guaranteeing uh, you know investments in fossil energy is a very good move that's getting rid of something that was were holding us back in favor of oil companies and i think that's an excellent development hans uh, what's yeah, yeah okay okay marco i just wanted to add one thing for us uh the most important thing to help in this shift was the high emission allowance price in the emission trading scheme uh, of, of the European Union. It was well known and well calculated that the uh, introduction of new uh, solutions like hydrogen required pretty high carbon price. And once the carbon price exceeded 50 euros per uh, ton, that was enough then to, to push uh, these hydrogen-based new solutions in the market. And without that, it would, wouldn't have happened. So we, we utilized, and every, every country in the EU is dependent on that the carbon price is high enough. And then we have all these solutions where we do jointly things. Hans, finally, it's your turn. <laughs> yes. Um, I agree with everything that has been said since Denmark is not on stage and our agency is in Copenhagen. I'll say that Maersk is leading on becoming climate neutral shipping company. So voila, the Danes have been represented now as well. Um, on top of what has been said, and it's not meant as, an, as a critical remark, but I think we should pay more attention to a couple of things. First of all, when we regulate to stimulate the new technologies to break through, that's one thing. I think we underestimate that we need to regulate the phasing out of what is not working. And we're not spending a lot of regulatory time or governance efforts on that. And so we know what we should be phasing out. Environmentally harmful subsidies, tax systems that are not helpful, but also inequality in society that is not helpful. And I know the Nordics are a particular type of society, but in general in Europe and in the world that is really hampering uh, the breakthrough of this new technology. People don't have the purchasing power to, to move to that uh, type of technology. Uh, and, you know, th that's where I think we are partially failing. If we look at environmentally harmful subsidies, we've been discussing that in the EU and in the OECD for almost three decades, and we make very little progress. And that is necessary to phase out what should be phased out. Environmental tax reform We've been talking about that for a long time. We just did a report on that. I can summarize it in four words. It's going nowhere. I think that's three words, actually. So, I, yes, I agree with all that has been said. But there are rather critical elements in our economy where we should pay more attention. And the last point is the financial system. I mean, the Americans are very blunt. They call it capitalism. Uh, in Europe, we're a, bit, a little bit more soft-spoken. We talk about the market economy, but it would be really bizarre to expect radically different outcomes in a system called capitalism without touching capital. And so I think it's really important that the EU took this sustainable finance initiative. I think it's really important that financial markets are paying attention to that and that Christine Lagarde uh, and the European Investment Bank are pushing in that direction because without touching the core of the investments the capital system, I don't think uh, we will go fast enough. So those would be some additional remarks on top of the, what, uh, what has been said. Thank you, Hans, for speaking out of the bag. Uh, uh, Espen, you have yes, some comments? Uh, well, first of all, I agree. It, we also have to make sure we stop doing things. It's not only about bringing in the new, that's true. And fossil subsidies is a tremendously bad idea. And I think everybody should scrap them right away. Uh, we do, but uh, others should also do that. But on the finance, one of the first decisions of, of importance that we this government made was to enhance the mandate of the Sovereign Wealth Fund, the world's largest fund, uh, so that it's uh, everything they own shall be uh, Paris compatible. So uh, 1.5 and that's zero compatible. And that's $1.3 trillion. That's quite a lot of money. That means we own 1.5 
percent of all the stocks and shares in the world, uh, and, uh, and and that is also a signal to other institutional investments. And they, by the way, also have a very strong biodiversity clause that they also want nature positive. So, so that's really probably the one big thing that we could do is how we organize our savings. These are the nation's savings for the future. And as um, as our prime minister said, if you save money for the eternity, you have to make sure that eternity is there. And you can't then use the money to have it go away. So you really have to, as these kind of eternal funds, have to have a particular focus on shifting one in the right direction. Let's uh, just, yeah, you, you want to comment on that, Matilde? Yeah. Uh, if this works, yeah. yeah. Just just quickly, I think uh, I think this is a really interesting discussion, and I think in order to um, kind of uh, get more people on board with us, because we agree with this more or less, right? But I, I think in order to get more people to agree that we have to shift money in finance and all of this, kind of it's it's a bit further away from people's daily lives, right? So I think we we should also not forget the um, because there's a lot of willingness. If, people in their personal lives as well to change their personal lives and i th i think we have to build this movement or you know do not going together in the in the same direction uh, both the big finance institutions and the um welfare systems and the oil fund and so on but also just people when they go to shop their daily food you know so i think we also need to think more about where do we put money and subsidies and taxes um that people feel in their daily lives more expensive meat People will probably be a bit disappointed or angry with that, but then less expensive um, beans or uh, vegetables or other things which are also healthy. And, and um, yeah, so I think we have to, and also just like, um, how do you say, uh, clothes which you use again. <laughs> uh, clothes that you use again, like uh, thrift, thrift, uh, yeah, thrifting or thrift shops. Uh, to, to not have taxes on, on thrifted clothes. And I think a lot of those things could make uh, make climate policy a bit more popular among people. You know, cheaper buses. Why aren't buses uh, free? You know, it's this. It's one of the solutions that we need in the in the um, climate-friendly society. So yeah, I think we have to have to speak and and uh, act on all levels. Uh, let me just uh, go on uh, and uh, change the subject uh, slightly here because. Um, at almost every debate uh, I have listened to, uh, where young people were represented, just transition has been the hot topic. And Matilde, how do you see this reflected in the Nordic government's approach in the no negotiations uh, at this COP? Do you see it at all? Mm, so, um my uh, from my perspective the nordic uh, governments are quite progressive in this uh, in the unf triple c and in the negotiations here um so yeah i don't know that's a difficult question right and i think also i represent a very broad uh, number of youth i represent all of norwegian children and youth so and they have different opinions as well so i think it's important to um to listen to different different opinions as well, but we had a uh, Espen was uh, was here when Nordic uh, many Nordic youth organizations delivered some common demands, um, and I think bringing those demands actually into into the table, referring to those kinds of uh, initiatives and those kinds of um, very concrete and also very um, well worked through um, policy papers is uh, is important. Yeah. Uh, one of those demands that you gave to, to Espen was uh, uh, the reduction or uh, cut, uh, total cut of um, fossil uh, fuel subsidies, uh, investments, uh, cut of uh, reducing investments in, in the fossil fuel industry, uh, and you had a couple more. But Espen, uh, look, looking at that, uh, those demands from, from a Norwegian perspective, is it realistic? On, on cut in fossil fuel subsidies, check. We agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to uh, demand and production, we think we need. We working hard here now to get into the cover decision uh, language on phasing out of fossil fuels all over. But uh, we don't believe that you don't f that phasing out is just cutting production in one place. You need a systemic change. Because the, unfortunately, the world is still 80% fossil, only 20% renewable. 
uh, in its energy system, that has to change fundamentally, but that means a myriad of activities in all aspects of life. And I do believe that energy producers have to be a part of that, but it needs to be a consolidated, uh, holistic approach to how you do that. So, so in principle, yes, but it cannot be done only on the supply side. It has to be demand and supply together. Mm. Yeah, Marco first and then Matilde. Right, mm. yeah, but I would add to this that there is no problem in phasing out coal, coal now. We have all technologies of doing that. Phasing out coal would mean 14 gigatons reduction in global emissions. We need to reduce emissions by 20 gigatons during the next eight years. Just doing that would help us to make the shift. For the others, gas and oil, things are more complicated. But there's nothing that, that prevents us phasing out coal immediately. Yeah. And I'd like, uh, very much like to add quickly to that, that I would even distinguish between coal, oil and gas. Because mm. if the phase down of oil will happen faster than the phase down of gas, and gas can actually become clean via CCS, so the blue hydrogen, uh, which means that you get green molecules basically from what used to be uh, gas. So, so, so it is more complicated, but, uh, but I agree. If we, we should start with coal mm. and then move to the other. Mm. Matilde, and then Hans. I just, uh, I think your uh, your question was a bit, um, I don't know, maybe weird because you asked, is it realistic? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that should not be the point of um, that should not be the starting point, right? It's not a question of whether it's realistic; it's uh, a question of what is needed. And then you have then you have to look at how can that how can we answer to the science, right? How can mm -hmm. we um, how can how can each of our country do all that we can to to reach those those um, goals that we've set we set ourselves and i think one of the most important things that young people uh want to see is a a plan that we trust in order to to um reach the 1.5 degree uh goal and also reach our national ndcs so i think um we can we can have discussions on what should be done first and the difference between different fossil fuels and the difference between uh how much government control or how much market based and all of it those are good discussions that we need to have but i think uh we have to start by having showing the world that we have a plan and uh, yeah give her a hand <laughs> hans okay i i like to come back a bit to your fundamental mm. justice question, just transition. And I think in, in essence, this debate is about justice and ethics, uh, because the distribution of costs and benefits of our, our current society are clearly so unequally distributed that this is no longer tenable. It's no longer acceptable from, from an ethical perspective, but also not from a, a, a policy or an economic perspective. And that is central in loss and damage. It's central in all the aspects that are discussed here. And I think this is a really good topic for the Nordics because the Nordics arguably are the most equal uh, region on the planet. And you know how much benefits you have from a more equal society. You c and there is good research on that. The more equal your society, it brings all sorts of things that we appreciate. Better health, better education, better gender balance, all of these things. Yeah? If you then look at an intergenerational and a global perspective, we are really lacking there. So going to a justice debate is essential. And if you look at the four income categories that uh, the UN system uses, and you make the balance of footprint of societies and the benefits of our current system, it's very clear. It's the OECD countries, so to speak, that reap the benefits from the current system at the expense of the others, and it's the others that are struggling to have their fair and equitable share. So I think paying more attention indeed to those things is essential. It's connected to fundamental human rights, but it will also be connected to a debate about distribution and consumption. I mean, the modelers at this moment, the best modelers on the planet, YASA, CSRO, they are very clear. If you want to reach 1.5 degrees and well-being for 10 billion people on this planet, we will have to end up discussing distributional issues and consumption. And I think that's a hard reality, but if we don't address it, we won't get there. So that is the justice debate in a nutshell for me. 
Marco, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. And actually, Espen started with that we need to solve these uh, climate finance issues. But let me say a, a couple of things concerning if you are thinking policies in our countries. We have been working a lot on the notion that what is just transition. And we have distinguished between three kind of uh, dimensions of it. One is distributional justice. The second is recognitive justice, which means that, that, that we, we take into account uh, uh, various groups, worldviews, and the way that they live. That is very important if you think about people in rural areas and let's say in agricultural type of, uh, of, of, of things. And then there is a procedural uh, justice, which means that, that, that decisions are made in, in the right way. And I think that we, we can still do and improve much of our policies as well if we are more, more kind of um, explicit on, on the notions that we need. But definitely these, these global issues are that those, uh, if we answer here well, I think that we have chances to get mitigation pushed forward. Um, Marco, while well, I have you here, I mean, um, speaking of consumption, we all can agree that we need uh, a systemic change, uh, uh, but we also need all hands on deck. Uh, the Nordic countries have among the highest carbon footprints per capita in the world. So, um, and at the same time, we in the Nordics say that we have decoupled uh, the emissions from growth. In my head, that doesn't really add up. So, uh, how, how do we go about uh, creating the change we need then? Do you have an answer for that? I see, I see, I, I see Hans is really... Yes. <laughs> the two are actually not contradicting. Europe, Europe as a whole, including Norway and Switzerland and Iceland, is the only region on the planet where indeed we have stuck to the Kyoto mm. uh, promises in the way they were calculated. We've seen our economies grow by 55 to 60 percent and we're now at minus 27, 28 percent of emissions. So we have done that. Are we still with a very high carbon footprint and material footprint? Yes, we are, which is why our ambition should be to be the, the most rapid moving part on the planet, also to go to net zero emissions, which Finland has stated as a, a national goal. Denmark is also uh, stating. So I think those two are not in, incompatible, but that's, I think, in the end, where the real challenge for the Nordics is. You have the best quality of life. You have been very supportive of this agenda. You've got the financial, technological, uh, economic actors to do it but you've got a really long distance to travel when it comes to your current footprint and where we need to end up mm. so you need to prove to the world that you are the region where it can happen because you have everything there to do it mm. Espen yes, and Marco. I agree yeah. and uh, um, yeah, both that both your points you know the the most advanced countries are actually on their way down even if the economy grows so we've broken the link between growth and emissions emissions down growth up it can be done but it's not enough we have to do better but the nordics uh, since this is the nordic pavilion the nordics have actually declared uh, the nordic council of ministers and the nordic council that we want to be leaders uh, among leaders you know really take this even further in the european competition you know for moving upwards on that by demonstrating clear projects through cooperation on decarbonization of everything you know step by step pilot 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 and i don't want to leave the scene without mentioning nature-based solutions because nature is an ex incredibly important ally actually the fastest and less expensive way to reduce emissions right now is to stop destroying nature and rather restore nature it, it doesn't preclude anything else but we also need to do that because a lot, uh, simply, if you have a road already, don't build the new one beside it. Uh, update the one you have that c preserves nature. That means carbon sink is uh, upheld. And these practical things is a big part of the climate struggle. And we Nordics are very much focused at, on building a bridge between the Climate Cup here and the Nature Cup in Montreal in a few weeks. Thank you. Uh, we, we're actually running out of time, Marco. Uh, and I have one last question for uh, everyone here. 
uh, and please keep it short because, I mean, uh, according to IPPC, we can achieve the net zero uh, world by 2050. There are options for every sector. So if you guys were a fortune teller, what will our societies look like in 2050? I'm going to start with you, Hans, and then we'll go. I'll give the Nordic answer. <laughs> I think the Nordic countries are probably the best place on the planet to live. In 2050, they should still be the best place on the planet to live, but carbon neutral, circular economy, high quality of life that includes a society that is changing in demographic and in all of those aspects and indeed being the voluntaristic leaders towards those on the planet that are in the worst conditions to help them to lift up uh, where you are. Yeah. Thank you. Espen? I, I think that um, when we are in, 90, in 2050 looking back, we will see that in the early 20s we realized A, that we had to change much faster but B, that it was easier than we previously thought because the solutions were more available than we were aware. So we actually improved faster than we thought, uh, you know, in late uh, 2022. Uh, and the interplay between technological advance, new solutions, smarter solutions, and uh, the drama of the crisis that's all around us will stimulate more politics. And I think the Nordics can do well. But we also have to be honest that it will be a more difficult world because it, the global warming will continue even if we stop at 1.5. So we will have invested massively in change in order to adapt to a more difficult climate. Marco. Uh, okay, uh, just uh, take another other, other angle. Uh, our houses are, are like now. They are made of steel, concrete and wood but all of them are now carbon free. Uh, uh, the food that we eat, part of it, a bulk comes from cell cultured proteins and the quality food comes from a uh, new type of agriculture. Uh, our goods are different from what we have now. They have produced in a sustainable way and we have much intelligence in our life. We have much di di digitalization in our lives. But it is true that our natures are different. We are expecting that the Finnish uh, climate is something like the, what Hungary has now. So our animals, our forests look different. And, uh, and, uh, and so our living environment somehow looks different from, from current ones. Snow is the one I'm afraid that we may lose. Wow. Matilde. So uh, I'm not a fortune teller, but I think uh, these kind of questions are really necessary because we have to have visions together and we have to listen to all sectors of society when we uh, think about not only what could go wrong, you know, by 2050 we all, always talk, or often I feel like we talk about everything that could go wrong and everything, every, all animals that we could lose and all ecosystems that we could destroy and so on, but we have to think about what could go right as well. And I think when we solve the climate crisis, we also have to work together with all of the other sustainability goals. So we have to be visionary. And I think in order to create that society that we want and with all of the aspects that you raised and also so many other ideas that we hear from the whole of society. And I think in order to actually implement that, we, re we really need to be brave. Now is the time to be super brave because that's what's needed from us. Thank you, Mathilde Angeltweit. Uh, Thank you also to Marco Olikainen, Espen Bart Eide and Hans uh, Brönitz. Uh, thank you a lot. And I would just like to say uh, that uh, this is Solution Day uh, and we have placed out cards on the, on the chairs here. So um, if you have your own solution uh, for the 2050, please write it down and share it with us and you can uh, leave it by the desk. Thank you.